Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth and final day of uh, our annual energy summit um, with uh, between the Center for Energy Studies and Baker Botts. Um, uh, it's been an interesting first three days, lots of very vibrant discussion uh, about a variety of issues that really kind of funnel into today's topic. Um, specifically, uh, you all, if you've not been hiding away in a cave somewhere, are aware that a lot is changing in the energy space, and there's been a lot, uh, a lot of announcements by different companies who are seeking, companies and governments, I should say, who are seeking net zero uh, uh, goals at different points in time over the next few decades. And um, there are lots of different touch points in those discussions with regard to new technologies, different fuel choices, um, how policy can play a role. And what we're going to focus on in this discussion today is, um, is those touch points. Uh, effectively, what are the roles of policy technology and, and the portfolio of available options to really drive uh, uh, deep decarbonization across the energy sector? Um, very fortunate to have with us today, um, you know, four just incredibly uh, successful, uh, well-known individuals in their own rights, um, addressing a variety of different issues that really will will feed into uh, uh, into this uh, into this uh, net zero aspiration, if you will. Um, we'll actually begin today with Stan Connolly. Stan is the uh, Executive Vice Pre President of Operations at Southern Company. Uh, Southern, of course, uh, recently um, made a splash with an announcement about its own net zero aspiration. So uh, I think it will be interesting to hear from, from Stan um, in particular about how a company that is not an oil and gas company, but actually an electricity uh, a generator and distributor um, is is going to achieve these goals and where the potential hurdles exist and, and sort of rough spots in the road. And that'll set the stage for um, a, a deeper discussion about policy and technology and different pathways that uh, ultimately can be taken. So after Stan, we'll hear from Greg Bertelson. Um, Greg is uh, the acting CEO of the Climate Leadership Council. Um, it's um, you know a group that uh, was really formed on the heels of Secretary Baker and Secretary Schultz uh, statements about a plan for uh, carbon dividends. Um, and Greg will sort of get into that effectively as a means of pricing carbon so that consumers can actually make uh, uh, more informed choices about energy, uh, uh, the energy that they consume. Um, after that, we'll hear from Steve Hill. Steve uh, is executive uh, vice president at Shell. Um, uh, his remarks will focus on the development of natural gas markets specifically. Um, uh, he's at Shell Energy, so they've actually made some recent announcement, announcements, some big splashes about um, net zero or low carbon LNG. Uh, we, of course, had a, um, a webinar not too long ago looking at uh, net zero LNG and how that market is developing. So um, it's going to be really nice to hear what Steve has to say in that regard and how it will add to um, a, a growing an increasingly vibrant discussion in the natural gas world. Uh, and then finally, we'll hear from Mike Graf, um, who has been with us before. Um, uh, he's gonna specifically focus on hydrogen and hydrogen is sort of the, 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 the fuel of choice in 2020, it seems like. Um, there's so much work being done to evaluate the potential of hydrogen in the energy sector. And Mike's gonna share with us um, you know, what, uh, what Air Liquide is doing uh, on that front and how it, it um, portends to play a big role in the energy transition. Um, so I don't really read a lot of bios. Those of you who have seen me do this, um, that's kind of the extent I'm going to go. The bios are available online, so please uh, feel free to read them at your leisure. Uh, what I want to do now is actually pass it over to Stan. Um, Stan, before you go, just real quickly, for those of you who are watching, um, if you've been with us the previous three days, you know that there is a Q&A box. Uh, everybody is open to questions, so please uh, let them fly. Um, I will filter through them after we're done with everybody's opening remarks, and uh, hopefully we'll have a really vibrant discussion. So with that, I'm going to pass it to you, Stan. Great, Ken. Thank you. I hope everybody can uh, see and hear me. I um, uh, really appreciate being invited to be a part of this discussion. Uh, it's great to hear that the first few discussions you've had were as robust and as vibrant and as I hope this one will be and look forward to collaborating with my partners over the next hour and a half. Uh, certainly, uh, Southern Company is, is, is proud to be a part of this industry, the electric utility industry, but even bigger, the energy sector of America. 
Um, and, you know, I think uh, I, I really wanted to lead with a thank you to the men and women of this this industry for everything they've done on this year that keep this, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Right. Uh, prior to this call, we were talking about everything that's happened in 2020. Uh, even today, we're seeing impacts to our industry, uh, and, but more importantly, to the citizens and the economy of coastal Louisiana, uh, I guess maybe ranging from Houston all the way across the Gulf. Uh, and certainly we want to keep the, men, the you know the citizens there, the men and women that are going to be working through uh, Hurricane Delta uh, in our thoughts and prayers. You know, this is the 25th named storm this year, in addition to the COVID pandemic that our industry has uh, has focused on as the 10th named storm to hit the coast. Uh, that's a record. That's the most ever. Um, and look, just this area that's going to get hit tonight and over the weekend was hit just six weeks ago. So really want to compliment uh, the state officials, compliment the federal officials that have helped our industry uh, navigate the challenges we've had this year. And I'm really proud of the folks, whether it's, you know, it's the pandemic or it's the, the, the storms or it's the wildfires. Uh, our industry, the electric utility industry, is, is referred to as one of those critical infrastructure businesses. And I'm just so proud of how our folks have responded this year to a lot of unexpected events, uh, some we could plan for on storms, but many we couldn't, namely the pandemic. They've just done a great job of taking care of customers. And, and really, that's kind of where I wanted to start this, this conversation as we build toward uh, the panel. And that's with a focus on customers. And then I, I certainly will transition to our net zero aspirations and some comments along that line. But look, this, this graphic you see before you here is something that Southern Company has uh, uh, has used as a model, both inside and outside of our business for a number of years now. With that customer at the center of how we think about approaching all of our decisions, uh, we believe that model really does drive positive outcomes for all of our stakeholders. You know, really kind of starting at six o'clock on that graphic, the high reliability, low prices, high customer satisfaction, really with that focus on those needs of our customers we do that well and working our way clockwise through the model, we really believe that our regulators uh, across the many states that we serve uh, will engage with us constructively to understand that this is really a highly capital intensive business that we operate that needs ongoing refreshment of that capital investment, as well as the capital investment that helps us achieve the carbon reduction goals that we'll talk about. And when we get that healthy, uh, constructive regulation, it leads to the healthy capital spending, which in turn, as you see, really help, really does help deliver uh, high, high reliability, low prices, and high customer satisfaction. Look, I, it's just our belief that alignment of those customer objectives, along with our long-term investment decisions and our carbon reduction strategies, keeping all that aligned through the eyes of the customer is one of the most important things we can do as a business. Uh, and the men and women of Southern Company, and many others across this industry are very much committed to keeping the customer at the center. Um, but, but, but look, specifically to a low carbon future, um, Ken, thanks for uh, making mention of our announcement here recently. I'll go back with you to uh, April of 2018. Southern Company was one of the first electric utilities to come out with a vision for a low carbon future. Um, and communicated our commitment back in, in 2018. Again, we're one of, the, one of the first to do that. We have recently updated that vision uh, and communicated our implementation and actions toward net zero by 2050. Um, a number of companies in our sector have done similar things, and 2050 seems to be a date out in time that we're all harmonizing around that long-term vision. And I think there's good reason for that, and we'll talk about what some of those reasons are. But you know, kind of built into that announcement, really, it, it overlays our business strategy really well. For a long time, we have believed that a diverse portfolio of energy resources was the right thing to do for our customers. And we still believe that's the right thing to do when you couple that with achieving a net zero future. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time today talking about um, how we get there. And one of those things we really need to deploy or continue deploying, maybe a better way of saying it, uh, is robust research and development so that we can take these evolving technologies, couple them with the tools we have in the toolbox, so to speak, today, 
uh, and develop and deploy more carbon free and carbon, even carbon negative technologies. And then lastly, you see a uh, Southern company has always believed that good constructive engagement in, in energy policy, whether it's the national level or state level, um, really delivers the best outcome for our customers. Uh, we, we absolutely believe in maintaining our state's ability to plan and deploy that diverse portfolio. Um, Every state has some differences. Every region has some differences. There are market differences uh, that uh, dictate some choices being better than others uh, in that portfolio. And again, just the engagement in policy to maintain uh, the state's ability to plan for that, we think is, is just so very important. Um, but let me highlight a little bit, a couple slides here to talk about our progress. Um, Certainly proud of the work this, this company has done over a number of years, but clearly we've got more work to do in the years to come. Uh, we, we baseline our emissions reductions back to 2007. Um, and look, I, you, you can see the progression of our carbon reduction strategies. In 2019, uh, we had 44% reduction. Um, look, just this year, uh, and, and certainly some of what I'm about to say is pandemic related and energy sales related. Uh, but contrasting our energy mix today versus some uh, nearly 15, 20 years ago, uh, heavy reliance today on natural gas. We think that has truly benefited our customers with the lowest price of natural gas. It also has had the benefit of reducing our carbon emissions. Uh, our nuclear fleet is an important part of who we are today and a growing part of who we are in the future. I'll talk about that some. Renewables are a growing piece of our portfolio. Uh, solar, some wind uh, in, in the Southeast where we primarily operate, solar is uh, the primary renewables option for us and that is growing quickly across our footprint along with some storage technologies. Uh, and hydroelectricity uh, has been a, a big part as well. Coal at one point for us, Ken, was some 70% of our energy production nearly 20 years ago. This year it will be below 20%. Um, and that reflects a quick transition, quite frankly, of that coal fleet. But uh, all in all, still the best decisions for our customers to deliver them the affordability they're looking for. You know, not really called out here, but energy efficiency has remained an important part of our decarbonization efforts. Uh, working with our customers to help them make wise energy choices every single day in their homes and businesses. So look, all of that has really kind of led to today. Uh, we believe, and we communicated this in 2018, and we, we, we affirmed it again this year with our net zero announcement uh, that we'll hit 50% reduction by 2030. But in fact, we believe well, that will happen sooner, maybe five years sooner. Um, so w what you really see is uh, the, the portfolio that we've deployed already and, and in how it's growing, as I described earlier, is delivering the kinds of reductions focused on carbon that we all aspire to. Uh, and I certainly believe some of those portfolio choices will carry us well beyond 2030. Um, but really getting to net zero uh, it, it is the focus of an awful lot of conversation and work for us. Um, you know, I've already mentioned our transition on coal. You can see that here. Uh, we still believe that, and, and by the way, 56 units, 56 operating units in our Southern Company fleet have been retired thus far, and we'll continue to work very closely with our state commissions on something we refer to as an integrated resource planning effort. All of our states have that. We periodically come to our commissions and talk about uh, how we achieve the most economical long-term resource mix for our customers. And by the way, we'll, we'll talk about this some more in, uh, later in the conversation, I'm sure. We already factor in a price on carbon in our models to make those decisions. Um, so that has been a part of our energy planning and integrated resource planning uh, construct now for a number of years. Our commissions are familiar with that. Um, so uh, I think as we talk about carbon, uh, we're making some decisions today reflective of where we want to go toward net zero. We do believe, uh, frankly, that uh, foundational to our future, nuclear will remain a portion of that hydro. We also firmly believe natural gas needs to be foundational to that going forward. 
it delivers not only baseload generation and therefore energy to our customers, that it gives, but it gives us flexibility. Uh, and I think we'll need that flexibility as we continue to, continue to integrate renewables and other technologies. But clearly, uh, we're expanding in renewables. Battery storage as well. Uh, we've got some projects in one of our subsidiaries in Georgia that we'll be uh, bringing to bear here soon. Um, I'm going to talk about modernizing the electric grid in a bit. Um, but really where I wanted to camp for a few minutes, if I could, is over this category of emerging technologies and negative carbon concepts. Uh, I think most, if not all, of my peers in the industry would agree that uh, moving toward net zero for some period of time, we're on the right trajectory to continue reducing carbon. It's really getting that last 10 to 20 percent, if you will, um, that it's going to be challenging. And, and I think most in our industry would uh, would say it's going to be challenging. Uh, but if, quite frankly, I'm bullish that uh, not just the electric sector, the energy sector altogether will come together uh, around some of the um, elements of the portfolio, if you will, to help move that forward. Um, Look, uh, you know, the first one here, beneficial electrification. Um, we've talked about that, beneficial in terms of efficient. Uh, there's a, a variety of different electrification options that can contribute to decarbonizing the whole economy, not just our sector. Um, we focus a lot on transportation in that space, and, and very recently at Southern Company, we announced we're going to transition our own fleet of light-duty vehicles by 2030. At least 50% of that fleet will... will uh, uh, go to an electric option by 2030. That's an example of an electrification option that I think we need to consider energy sector wide. Um, but then you get to some of the other longer term things. Um, you know, I, and let me talk about research and development for a second. Southern Company again has been involved in in research and development for a, for 50 years, and for a number of years we have uh, evaluated developed and helped deploy technologies at the customer level, all the way up through our environmental equipment technology selections, um, but as well, large scale energy choices. And I think going forward, our decarbonization focus uh, in our R&D space is, is clearly focused on the energy resource options that deliver the deeper decarbonization that I think we're all talking about. Um, Southern Company has been proud to host the National Carbon Capture Center at our facility in Wilsonville, Alabama, for a number of years now. Had a great partner in the Department of Energy and a number of other companies that have chosen to invest at that National Carbon Capture Center. The focus at one time was on developing carbon capture technologies for emissions from coal fire generation. We've recently transitioned that site. It is now focused on capturing carbon from natural gas generation emission streams. Uh, and Department of Energy has recently recommitted to staying involved at the Carbon Capture Center. Uh, as I said earlier, we just absolutely believe that natural gas needs to remain a part of the portfolio for some portion, if not all of this transition. And having carbon capture, uh, along with utilization and storage technologies for that, we think is an important place for the industry to remain focused. We've also recently announced that we want to expand not just the uh, the capture of carbon through generation emission streams, but direct air capture uh, research at that same carbon capture center. We're proud to uh, to be starting that work. It's very early, uh, working with a number of partners to explore where we might could go. But you know, talking about the net neg net negative or the or the net zero technologies. Um, we need technologies that also produce the net effect, if you will, uh, to help us offset what might be some small but remaining carbon emissions from our processes in generating electricity. Um, another area we're spending a lot of time, and you teed this up, Ken, I think very well in your opening comments, uh, a lot of people are talking about hydrogen or more broadly alternative energy carriers. I think we'll talk about that a bit more uh, among the panelists. Uh, Southern Company and a number of utilities in our space and some original equipment manufacturers 
are working with EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, along with the Gas Technology Institute. Uh, those two groups have partnered together and have announced a low carbon resource initiative. And one of the early areas of work is around alternative energy carriers. And so again, that work is very early, but I think it clearly is focused on the right things to help us consider other forms of of energy carriers that could be deployed long term. Got to get the price down, got to figure out a way to produce it more readily. Uh, but I think there's a number of folks across the energy sector that are working on that. I, I bring advanced nuclear generation to the conversation. Um, I, I'll back up and say we're proud to, to be deploying new nuclear today at Southern Company. New nuclear along with over 2,300 megawatts of renewables and storage. That's a part of our near term work here. Uh, those new nuclear units, obviously carbon free, will make a big step change for us in the, number, in the next few years related to our carbon emissions. But advanced nuclear generation, nu nuclear uh, assets is an area of focus for us. We've been partnering with TerraPower for a number of years now to evaluate that. That too is a space that I think over time we need to continue to develop and include in this portfolio as we move forward. Um, I, I've mentioned the industry collaboration. I just do, I do think that's incredibly important. I don't think it's just the electric sector. I think it's oil and gas. It's it's a number of folks in this energy space um, that need to be collaborating going forward. It's conversations like this that I think can help produce ongoing collaboration uh, with the center and uh, and other groups to help us keep moving forward here. I want to back up and hit on really another important point here: the resilient, fully integrated energy delivery grids. Um, Every company in my industry is continuing to invest in the transmission and distribution network um, that is so vital to enabling this carbon transition. Um, you know, for, for, for a long, long time, um, this grid was designed to support more central station or centralized energy resources to distribute that, that out to homes and businesses. Clearly, our energy future will have a much more distributed model to that, whether it's microgrids in neighborhoods or it's rooftop solar or it's utility scale renewables. Uh, it, it will be a much more diverse and distributed network of energy resources that we have to tie to, tie to this grid. And look, at the end of the day, our customers expect the energy to flow when they flip the switch. Um, to many of them, they are unaware of where that energy is coming from and, and quite frankly, counting on us to integrate that for their benefit. Uh, we'll continue to need to invest in technology, but upgrades to existing assets uh, on that grid to make that happen. And by the way, make it more resilient to uh, the natural disasters and the cyber threats, some of which we're experiencing today, right? So all of these elements of the portfolio will matter. And some will be developed sooner than others. Um, time will tell how that works. Uh, one of the areas of policy that we believe is going to be important going forward is making sure we get federal support for some of the, the harder R&D that needs to take place, uh, that we can mitigate risk of first of its kind deployment, uh, and that maybe we set up some public-private partnerships to help uh, mitigate some of that risk. So that's another element of, I think, the policy conversation that will be important for us in, in a bit. So um, really just to kind of summarize, and I hope I've done an adequate job maybe of teeing up some of the conversation, Ken, we're going to have going forward here, and you can pull some strings and, and chase some of this. Um, Southern Company is so privileged to serve some 9 million customers across our states. We have electric business, we have gas LDC businesses spread out across mostly the eastern half of the United States, but we have a, a, a wholesale business and a distributed energy infrastructure business really all over the country, interfacing with customers uh, everywhere we go. But one thing that has to remain consistent across all those is keeping that customer at the center. Uh, that's a part of our long-term business strategy. We believe carbon reductions and the strategy that go with, goes with that aligns with that long-term business strategy. Uh, but we have to keep, you know, the least among us 
uh, frankly, in mind as we make this transition. We serve a number of customers that may, I think it's 40% less than $40,000 a year in income. We've got to keep those customers in mind as we make this transition. As I said earlier, they want the energy to flow when we flip the switch, but they also want to do what uh, they, we want to do what they expect in terms of affordability too. So uh, making sure we stay focused long-term that way is important. We have been a leader in developing environmental solutions for a long time. Look, th these communities in which we serve energy, we live and work there too. Uh, and I know a number of my panelists would say the exact same thing. They wanna be the absolute best neighbor they can be in those communities. Uh, we're committed to that. We know part of that is continuing to reduce the environmental impact we have, including carbon. Um, and we are we have been and are committed to continuing to be that leader going forward. Uh, and, and as I've said, I think, and, and hopefully I've outlined for our discussion, um, our future is absolutely built on the progress we've made in the past. Uh, look, I truly believe the pathway that brought us here today is the diversified por por portfolio. It's the robust industry leading development we've been doing for a long time. It's the engagement in the national energy policy that we've been doing for a long time. Look, I don't think that pathway changes if we stay focused on these elements of the pathway. I think we've got a good model to carry us forward. It has really made significant impacts, uh, not only for the benefit of the environment with carbon reduction, but for the benefit of our customers. Um, and as I've said so many times here already this morning, keeping them at the center is so important to us. So, Ken, that's the highlights of what I wanted to do this morning. And, and, and hopefully uh, you learned a little bit about Southern Company and what we're doing. Uh, our commitment to net zero is so clear. I hope uh, others have had a chance to maybe uh, take a look at that, the report we issued. If not, it's certainly out on our website. Um, it's reflective of an awful lot of thought, an awful lot of history, but an awful lot of input from important stakeholders, uh, including our regulators and our customers and, and uh, just gosh, so many that have helped shape our thinking here. So with that, Ken, I think I'll turn it back to you. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak to this group today. And uh, I look forward to uh, chatting with these panelists. Great, uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, you certainly have raised a number of questions in my own mind, and we'll definitely come back to those here in, a, in just a little bit. But I can tell you also that um, uh, our audience is, is firing away as well. Lots of questions uh, that touch on the cost of generation, the cost of rate payers associated with transitions, the viability of hydrogen, um, development of electrolysis in that space, um, the price of carbon, direct air capture, uh, affordability just more generally. And then of course, um, some folks have asked questions about the shifting uh, 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 shifting environment in the energy transition discussion and how that engenders lots of uncertainty and, and a changing pace of, you know, a different pace of change, I guess. And the one thing that I always say is, you know, one thing that's certain is uncertainty, right? So um, I, I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about the a value that a portfolio brings because it actually allows you, it engenders, engenders flexibility to allow you to sort of deal with some of those challenges as we move down the road. Um, I, uh, I'm definitely gonna come back to you um, because uh, you definitely set the stage for everybody else. And some of the questions that are coming through will certainly be addressed actually by um, uh, by the, uh, the rest of the colleagues we have on the panel here. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Greg Bertelson. Um, Greg, you should be able to take control of the slides and uh, the floor is yours. All right. Well, thank you, Ken, and thank you, Stan. Enjoyed your presentation and thanks everyone for being with us this morning. Uh, name is Greg Burleson. I am the, uh, for the Climate Leadership Council. Um, and we have a very uh, notable link with our hosts from the, the Baker Institute for Public Policy, which I'll get into in a moment because Ken asked me to begin my remarks describing my personal experience for getting to where I am today working for this particular organization. So on February 8th, 2017, if you can think way back to nearly four years ago, two weeks into the Trump administration, at the time I was a lobbyist for an organization called the National Association of Manufacturers, the largest industrial trade association in the country. <clears throat> I was their energy and environmental lobbyist. I was minding my own business on a Wednesday morning when I got an alert from the Washington Post that Secretary 
James Baker III was in the White House pitching a carbon tax. Got my attention. Then I got an alert from the Wall Street Journal and then an alert from the New York Times. And by about uh, 10 a.m. that morning, every major newspaper in the country uh, was astir uh, and was reporting that a group of very prominent Republican elder statesmen were meeting with the Trump White House to discuss a carbon dividends plan. Now, I don't know how much the audience knows about the National Association of Manufacturers and its 12,000 member companies, but I can assure you there is a wide diversity of opinions on the concept of a carbon tax. And for most of the day on February 8, 2017, I heard those opinions um, and from all ends of it. Member companies encouraging me to support what was being discussed at the White House and certainly member companies who were encouraging me uh, to do the opposite. Uh, but once the, day, the dust settled on the day, I had the opportunity to dive in uh, in a little more detail to this document, which hopefully you're seeing on your screens, the conservative case for carbon dividends. And in it was a framework developed by the co-authors on the cover, most notably James Baker and George Schultz, who have become the namesake of the policy that we promote, and four interconnected pillars. Um, what I found was a very pragmatic, a very thoughtful, uh, very ambitious climate solutions founded under the principles of free markets and limited government. And so I got very interested very quickly. And over the course of the next week or so, this effort was increasingly festering in my own mind. And so I had to reach out to the organizers to see what, uh, what they were up to, because I was curious. Well, long, long story short, uh, within about two weeks, I had committed to join the uh, weeks old organization and lead their business recruitment and advocacy work. Um, so with that as a, my introduction to this organization and policy, I wanted to introduce you, for those who are not familiar, to the Baker Schultz plan and the policy that we believe ultimately will be the policy that brings sufficient bipartisan support together to solve climate change in a meaningful way in the United States. So the plan, again, rests on four interconnected pillars. The first is a gradually rising fee on carbon, which um, has already been discussed uh, today. Economists from across the political spectrum, essentially every con economist alive, with perhaps a few exceptions, agree that the most efficient and effective way to rapidly decarbonize the economy is with an economy-wide carbon fee. Um, and so that's the first pillar of the program. The second is to take all of the revenue from that fee and return it directly back to the American consumer. In Stan's presentation, he talked a lot about the need to ensure that his rate payers are receiving affordable rates. And we could not agree with that more. We need to ensure that as we make this transition, we are not asking those who can least afford it to shoulder the bulk of the burden. And I'll come back to that in a moment. The third pillar is what we call regulatory simplification. So with a carbon price in place, driving substantial carbon emissions throughout the economy, it would justify taking some of the pressure off the regulatory mechanism for driving those same emission reductions. And again, as I'll talk about a little later, the carbon fee approach is far more effective than the past regulatory approaches that we've seen over the last several years. And then finally, border carbon adjustments to ensure that we maintain the competitiveness of U.S. firms. Um, and as I'll talk about a little later, because of the investments that companies like Southern and other utilities have made in the economy, our economy is actually more efficient than the world average. So that fourth pillar, border carbon adjustments, actually creates an opportunity for many of our businesses to realize a competitive advantage. Again, a concept I'll come to in a few moments. 
after the launch of the organization, we got to work building what is now the largest coalition in U.S. history to support a climate plan. We have uh, 25 Fortune 100 sized companies, many recognizable brands. What tends to get the most attention are the companies that are labeled under the energy founding members group. But of course, we have the largest auto manufacturers, the largest consumer company uh, products companies. I would note that Shell has been one of our founding members since the beginning, uh, which we are grateful and looking forward to hearing Steve's comments in a few minutes. Three of the largest NGOs in the country. And then if you look at the individual portion of the slide, you'll note that we have individuals from across the political spectrum. So of course, we have the original co-authors of, of Secretaries Baker and Schultz. But we also have uh, President Obama's Energy Secretary, Stephen Chu and Ernie Moniz. We have uh, Larry Summers from the Clinton administration, Christy Todd Whitman, who was a Republican EPA uh, uh, head. So while we were founded by a group of Republicans, we are a nonpartisan organization who wholeheartedly believes that it is going to take a bipartisan effort to ultimately solve this issue at a policy level. This group has been working together for about the last three years to develop the finer details of those original four pillars. And in February of this year, we released this document, the Bipartisan Climate Roadmap, which contains those additional policy details and, and built upon the original plan, uh, plan developed by Secretaries Baker and Schultz and others. So we'll talk a little bit more about the impacts of this plan and ultimately why we think it is the right approach for the climate, the right approach for the economy, and the right approach politically. So what I'm showing here on this slide is three different scenarios based on 20, 2005 uh, emissions beginning in the year 2018. So if you look at the blue line at the top, what we are showing is this is business as usual. You could think of this as the, as the Trump baseline. So this is where we would expect U.S. emissions to be given the rollback of some of the Obama era regulations. So expectation would be emissions would stay relatively flat until 2025. The green line is perhaps the most surprising on this chart and demonstrates where we would have been or where we would be had the Obama era regulations stayed in place and been um, allowed to continue as designed. And while there is a larger emission reduction than the new baseline, um, it still falls well short of the U.S. Paris commitment, um, which is a useful reference point. And then if you follow down to the red line, that's where our plan gets you, 32% by 2025. And the big point to make here is the economy-wide price on carbon is just a far more effective way to lower emissions because from day one, you are enlisting the entire economy, all sectors of the economy, to get to work and find the lowest cost emission reductions. And this is why economists are so supportive of this approach. The other great advantage of a carbon price, coming back to this theme of enlisting the entire economy, is it is the single best energy innovation policy we have for stimulating investments and carbon reductions throughout the economy. Rather than focusing on a sector by sector approach, and by the way, we should say R&D and that type of investment is of course critically important to this discussion. And so I, I certainly agree with Stan's comments earlier. But in terms of a policy to stimulate innovation throughout the economy through all sectors, a carbon price is the single most effective way to do this. And this is from a report that we're showing that was published in July of 2020 and found that a carbon price like envisioned in the Baker-Schultz plan would stimulate $1.4 trillion of new investment in technological innovation by 2035, create 1.6 million jobs, generate a competitive advantage for U.S. companies, and I'll come back to that momentarily, uh, and by 2035, reduce CO2 emissions by 57%. Again, this is across the economy in all sectors. Um, and then result in a significant investment in, uh, in renewable technologies as well. A lot of talk in Washington about innovation these days, innovation policies. 
this truly is the innovation policy. So this is a bit of a complex slide, so forgive me, I'll try to explain it briefly. We worked with uh, a firm over the summer to get a better assessment of how the U.S. economy stacks up against some of its major partners in terms of our carbon footprint. And what we looked at was, based on a number of different industrial processes, how does the U.S. stack up from a carbon efficiency standpoint? And so the way to read this chart is you've got the sectors on the left-hand side, side and countries at the top. And we set the U.S. for a benchmark at one. So any number that is above one in any of the sectors or countries uh, in the chart means that the U.S. is more efficient, meaning we can make the same or similar product while emitting less carbon. And so I just direct your attention to the very final row where you can see the average for each country. And so if you look at the world column in the final row, you'll see that the U.S. is about twice as carbon efficient as the world average. We're about three times as efficient as China and four times efficient as efficient as, as India. This is notable. A lot of the concern about climate action, domestic climate action, um, unilateral climate action is around a concern that it will somehow negatively impact U.S. competitiveness. And that's certainly something that's front and center in the political conversation right now, American competitiveness for new manufacturing uh, or stimulating manufacturing here in the U.S. What this chart shows is that with the right climate and trade policy, i.e. with a carbon price and a border carbon adjustment, not only will we level the playing field, but we will create for many industries a competitive advantage because they are currently operating more efficiently, meaning when goods come into the country from less efficient parts of the world or less efficient for, uh, uh, production practices, and they are assessed the same fee in the U.S. market, that will create a competitive advantage. And so this, we think, is a, is a very big deal and a very important part of the policy conversation going forward. And then the final impact slide I wanted to show is how households come out. Um, and I talked about this a few moments ago, but as we think about transitioning to a low carbon future towards net zero emissions, we do have to be mindful to ensure that we're bringing the country along we're not asking those who can least afford it to shoulder the bulk of the burden. And what this uh, slide is showing is how families come out based on which income decile they're, they're working on. So we're showing year one of our policy and year five of our policy. And what you'll note is that between the eighth and ninth decile, uh, depending on the year, net out financially ahead, meaning that if you're in the bottom 80 to 90 percent of income uh, of households by income on average you'll actually net out ahead under this program meaning that you'll receive more in a dividend payment than you would pay in increased energy and other costs as a result of the carbon fee so shifting gears to the political discussion as I mentioned earlier, we're, we're very confident that we are moving in the direction of um, progress at the federal level on, on federal policy. And this slide, I think, does a good job of telling the story of why. I believe we are very clearly on a trend line in terms of where the American public is on climate action. And so I'll, I'll work through this fairly quickly, but this is a poll that we ran uh, a little bit less than a year ago looking at how different voters feel about climate and specifically how they would view a plan like the Baker Schultz Carbon Dividends Plan. What we found is that voters in general, uh, about 65 support and four to one support uh, versus oppose. Perhaps not surprisingly, the largest group of support is among Democrats who widely support it. Uh, independents supported by a large margin as well. And then if you look down to the last two bars, which I think are the most interesting, you'll see that there's a slight uh, lean towards a su supporting it among all Republicans. 
but that support number jumps 13 percentage points when you're just looking at Republicans under the age of 40. And if you take a step back and you think about voters in six different blocks, you've got Democrats, Republicans, independents, and then each of those uh, political affiliations under and over the age of 40. And what you'll find, and this is true in any poll regarding climate that you look at, five of the six of those categories support uh, action on climate, would support something like a carbon dividends bill. The only sixth uh, voting block that would be slightly opposed would be Republicans over the age of 40. And so if you think about the rapid evolution that's taking place really on both in both parties on climate, the increasing focus on it, but in particular, just how much progress we've seen among Republicans stepping out and looking for climate solutions. I believe this dynamic is central to that transition in viewpoints. It's very clear to us, I think it's very clear to members of Congress that voters today want to see their lawmakers addressing climate and as they look ahead, it's very clear that that is only going to increase with, with time. And I'll just share a few other things kind of highlighting this point. There have been a few um, groups that have popped up among young folks supporting this approach. There's a group called Young Conservatives for Carbon Dividends. They were at CPAC, which is um, a very conservative uh, conference each year. First time a group of young conservatives supporting a climate solution have, have hosted an event at CPAC. They got a really uh, surprisingly warm reception. There's also, there's also a, an effort or a letter that was signed by 350 student government college presidents that was released over the summer about the most diverse list of colleges and universities you could possibly imagine, uh, all signed on to a statement supporting uh, a carbon dividends solution. So it's clear that the, the youth movement on this is strong, and I would imagine that only will continue to grow with time. And so if you'll indulge me for just a minute or two more, I want to close on a bit of a somber note. Um, we, of course, owe our, um, our place in the policy discussion to the leadership of Secretaries Baker and Schultz, uh, for whom we would not be where we are today as an organization without their uh, initial leadership. But the engine behind the progress we've made over the last three and a half years um, was from our founder, Ted Halstead, who tragically passed away uh, last month. Um, and so as I uh, present this all to you, this concept to you, which, I'm, which I am grateful for, um, it's appropriate for me to acknowledge the work that Ted has, has done um, and the great loss that we've all suffered, those of us who want to see uh, climate action, it's been a huge loss. And for really anybody who believes that we can accomplish more working together, working across the aisle than in our own silos, um, it was a big loss as well. So thank you for permitting me the opportunity to, to share that. Uh, thanks for inviting me to this conference. It's been uh, a great discussion so far, and I look forward to uh, hearing from the other panelists and the uh, question and answer portion. So again, thank you. Uh, delighted to be with you. Thanks, Greg. And uh, I'm glad you um, uh, took the time to comment on Ted uh, Ted's importance for, for the Climate Leadership Council and everything that y'all have been doing. Um, he's actually the one who connected you and I. So um, I'm thankful to him for that. And, and it is indeed tr tragic that he's passed. Um, uh, but it's also good to see you carrying on the good work um, that's going on there. Uh, you raised a couple of really interesting points. Um, you reiterated the importance of research and development. Um, we're definitely going to come back to that. Um, you also mentioned uh, effectively pricing in carbon efficiency, uh, which is an interesting concept from an international trade context. Um, uh, and it certainly bears some discussion. So we'll also come back to that without a doubt. Um, and then finally, which I think is is really critical for all of this discussion about energy transitions. You mentioned the shifting um, uh, shifting landscape in terms of uh, voter priority 
uh, with regard to climate policy, but uh, in general, how that's changing amongst uh, uh, voters of different age groups. Uh, so you're truly seeing an evolution in terms of um, uh, uh, opinions toward climate policy and what might actually be effective. Uh, of course, you know, and anybody will tell you this, and I'm sure you know it, the devil's always in the details, right? So um, uh, that's certainly something to be worked out, and that's, you know, why you have the meetings behind closed doors and hearings at Congress. But um, uh, without a doubt, we're seeing a shift in overall attitude. Um, so thank you for that. Um, uh, next, I want to shift to uh, Steve Hill. Uh, Steve, uh, you should be able to run the slides uh, from your side. There we go. Uh, the floor is yours. Hey, Steve, I think you're muted. I'm going to make you start over again. <laughs> I was, and it was brilliant. It was really brilliant. And But anyway, um, thanks for pointing out I was muted, Ken, and the opportunity to speak to you today. And um, you, you asked me to talk about carbon neutral LNG. That's quite a specific topic, so I thought I would meander a little bit on my on my way to get there. Not Not too far. I've only got three slides. But I was going to talk a little bit about the role of natural gas. It's clearly in the spotlight today as whether it's part of the problem or part of the solution. And um, Stan certainly made the part of the case for why it's part of the solution. I want to talk a little bit about the timeline going forward. It's great that we have these carbon neutral um, targets for 2050 and 2060, but CO2 emissions are cumulative. And what we do over time is really, really important. We can't just sit back and wait to 2049 and the perfect technology to, co to come along. There'll be a lot of CO2 already in the air at that point. So pathways are really, really important. And I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, CO2 emissions partner in crime, which is poor air quality. And you, you probably see my slide triggering that, that part of the discussion. You know, we're part of some tremendous discussions in Europe today about how to decarbonize the gas system. But the reality is CO2 emissions from coal in Asia today is 10 times greater than CO2 from, from gas in Europe. And if we really want to get a quick fix and make a material impact in the near term, it's by re replacing coal with gas in Asia. Um, the chart here shows um, India on, you know, what could be called a bad day. Maybe it's becoming a typical day. And, um, and the, um, the sky in China on a, on a good day. Now, if you went back five years, the picture in China would look exactly the same as the picture in India. And what changed was the introduction of natural gas to replace coal, not in power generation, but in industry and in residential heating. It was basically taking the small inefficient boilers with, with low chimneys in the middle of cities and replacing them with modern boilers, natural gas. And that's what caused the air quality to improve in, in parts of China. But Asia still has a, a massive, massive problem. There's billions of people whose life quality and life expectancy is being affected by air quality today, or poor air quality today. If you take four big cities, Beijing, um, Delhi, Jakarta, and Seoul, that's almost 140 million people. And last year, there was one day in one of those cities where air quality was deemed to be healthy by the WHO standards. So while we improve CO2 emissions, we will also have a massive benefit on, on air quality. So the energy transition is massively complicated. And as an industry, we don't help simplifying it. So I've tried to do that a little bit today. And it's kind of learning from the, the successful reduce, reuse, recycle campaign that we're all familiar with. Um, how do you get to net zero emissions? Well, first of all, you start by avoiding emissions where you can. Part of that is energy efficiency, but the biggest driver of that will be increased electrification. Over the rest of the century, we expect electricity to go from about 20% to about 50% of the overall energy mix, and that electrification to be driven by renewable power. So the growth in renewable power will be a massive contributor in how we avoid emissions. But there is about 50% of energy demand in the long term that's going to be in sectors that's simply hard to electrify. It could be 
heavy duty long haul transport or certain um, industrial usage uses or certain heating uses where you simply need energy density or molecules and hydrogen will play a role but there's a big scaling challenge to place there biofuels will play a role but the world can only grow so much without impeding on the on the food chain so therefore we expect there still will be fossil fuels in the mix for some time so that moves you on to reduce so where you do need to use fossil fuels, you need to use the cleanest one that's available at a time, as the research and technology then will bring cleaner and cleaner solutions going forward. And we have an example here in, in shipping. Um, shipping typically uses oil as its fuel today. And there's a lot of thought about how do you use ammonia or methanol or hydrogen as the end state, but none of those are available today. So switching oil, sorry, shipping, um, from oil to LNG, which is a readily available industry today and where we're rapidly putting the last mile of the supply infrastructure in place, will reduce emissions from shipping until the cleanest solution comes along. But the uses of energy that will create emissions create emissions, and therefore you need to find a way to get the CO2 that is inevitably going to be produced back from the air into the ground as simply and as efficiently as possible. Now, that could be carbon capture and storage, but it could also be more um, natural solutions and offsetting using um, preserving or reforest preserving forests or um, creating new forests or, or other natural sinks of, of CO2. And that's where the concept of um, net carbon free or carbon neutral LNG came from. There are some customers who want to be part of the solution today, but have a form of energy demand that simply can't be electrified or um, supplied with a renewable solution today. We have LNG customers who are, who are using LNG because natural gas is the cleanest solution for their form of energy demand, but they recognize that natural gas has emissions. So therefore we have combined our LNG supply with our um, offsets from our own nature-based solution projects around the world to create a zero net carbon solution um, for our customers to meet their own corporate aspirations, to support their own sustainability journeys, and to um, enable them to market zero net carbon solutions to their own downstream customers. Um, one of the customers shown here, Tokyo Gas, um, recently announced, or in fact this week announced the sale of net carbon free natural gas to one of its customers in, in Japan. So we're starting to build a net carbon free value chain based on the cleanest available solutions that are available today until the world can develop and put in place genuine zero carbon solutions. And that's just one example. We have four shown on this chart. Um, if you buy your gasoline um, from Shell in the UK or the Netherlands, then you can buy zero net carbon gasoline. And again, it's the same thing. It's gasoline um, combined with offsets from nature-based solutions. Um, we have 180 fleet customers now that are buying zero net carbon um, diesel for their, for their trucking needs. And Gaslog is one of our shipping company customers where they're now actually buying um, zero net carbon lubricants by, again, us combining offsets to offset the um, emissions from the lubricant production process and giving them a net carbon solution. So many, many customers in the world have sustainability agendas and goals. And what we are doing is trying to create as many options for our customers to help them achieve it as possible. So I was a bit quicker than the others, but hopefully that'll give us more time for a quality discussion in a while. Hopefully that's good, Ken. <laughs> uh, that's fantastic, Steve. Thanks. Um, you actually raised a couple of interesting points that uh, are, are actually right in the middle of uh, a lot of things that we're involved with in terms of research here at the Center for Energy Studies. Um, in particular, when you get to the natural solutions, there's a couple of efforts ongoing. Uh, here that um, I think are really interesting. They're market oriented and, and for anybody who's interested, I'm certainly happy to uh, uh, engage in that offline. But um, uh, one question that I just want you to think about because it, 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 it certainly is central to this, right? The offset notion is uh, one of measurement and verification. 
Um, and ultimately, you know, you can talk about the existing portfolio, but in a world where you have expanding electrification, more natural gas use, you've also got to scale those offset mechanisms. So um, give that a little bit of thought. We'll definitely come back to that because I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Um, okay. So next, next I want to move to uh, Mike Graff. Mike, uh, hopefully you can run the slides. Thanks, Ken, and, and, and thanks to you and uh, everyone at Baker for uh, the uh, invitation to join with uh, Stan and, and Greg and Steve and everyone else that's, that's joined us on, on the video conference today to talk about this very important subject. Uh, for those of you that don't know Errol Akeed, very briefly, uh, we're one of the world's largest uh, We touch or enable every industry there is. Uh, and also provide healthcare in, in, in almost every country around the world. Uh, clearly, our, our 67,000 associates work hard in 80 countries around the world uh, to meet our customers' needs in a, in a reliable and in a safe way all the time. And, and our core attribute for the future has always been driven by innovation and, and technology development. And with that sustainable mindset that we've always had, uh, even today, as we look at the new technologies we develop, if we look at those innovations that evolve, they not only meet the exacting needs and the future needs of the many industries we serve and the future industries that we can help create, uh, but they do that in a way that also provides benefit from a human health and, and also for the health of the planet as those are implemented. So for, for Air Liquide and, and listening to what everybody talked about today, I think everybody is looking at, first of all, how do we deal with our own climate objectives? How do we think about how we manage ourselves? And, and the way we looked at this, we, we tried to take not only a global approach uh, to address everything we do uh, around the world, but also to recognize the many stakeholders and the many uh, issues and needs they have as, as they think about how they deal with their own climate issues. And, and how we work together uh, to create a more sustainable world. So we started with our own assets. Uh, we, we looked at where we were, and several years ago, uh, we, we uh, had a climate objective uh, to go ahead and reduce our own carbon intensity uh, by 30%, looking at where we were as a benchmark in 2015 and where we could lead to in, in 2025. And that really focused on, on, on several key areas. That The first was the utilization of renewable energy. Uh, we committed to increase our use of renewable energy by uh, over two thirds uh, in that period of time. Uh, recognize that may, may sound very important and clearly it is, uh, but when you're dealing with an industry that has to operate seven days a week, 24 hours a day, uh, to leverage and utilize renewable power, especially from solar and wind, that isn't always there. You've really got to think hard about how you manage your systems, how you design uh, your infrastructure and, and the ecosystem you create to operate. In, in addition to that, uh, we, we also uh, went ahead and, and we worked to go ahead and rethink our design of our facilities, the new plants that we build to make them ever more efficient while we look to upgrade and refurbish or replace the older existing assets that may have been in operating as long as for the past 40 years. And so we have that balance. And in addition to that, we've really introduced a lot of new digital technologies uh, to allow us to run our plants ever more efficiently, uh, which of course brings safety and reliability uh, to the forefront as well. Uh, but, but also to think about the use of, of artificial intelligence and, and how we pair customer needs, our own production facilities uh, across our, our many, many thousands of pipeline systems around the world. And then lastly, we looked at how we serve our customers that we serve on a more local basis. Uh, we probably have, as we speak today, something on the order of 12 to 15,000 vehicles on the road, certainly 6,000 here in the U.S. So how do we manage those logistics systems to meet our customers and our patients' needs in, in a better way? And, and so utilizing digital capabilities and artificial intelligence to better plan efficient routes, to better plan how we, we pair customer needs, our own production facilities and logistics systems, we've actually been able to go ahead and, and almost reach uh, our goal and our objective that we set for ourselves by 2025. As a matter of fact, as we announced uh, back in February, uh, by the end of 2019, we had already achieved some 27% of that 30% reduction, reduction that we had targeted. So we're well on our way and continue to look for ways to go ahead and improve. The second element to this was customers. And so it's not just what we can do 
within our own operations and, and how, how we manage ourselves, but how do we continue to help enable our customers not only go ahead and, and, and manage all that they need to do to create the great products and provide the services that they do around the world, but we also needed to go ahead and think about how we could better enable them uh, to create the mindset uh, within the ecosystem to allow them to perform in a more sustainable way, meet their climate objectives, and maybe bring technologies and new ideas to bear that they hadn't thought about. Certainly we can, we can aggregate customer need, we can, we can certainly meet that need with bigger plants, larger plants, more efficient plants. In some cases, if it's, if it's customers that we meet uh, with liquid or with package gases, uh, we can look to build maybe an on-site facility to meet their needs. But the real drivers that we were able to go ahead and, and bring to bear are new applications and new technologies, especially for the larger, more commoditized industries to make them more efficient. So our oxy combustion processes, where we actually utilize oxygen uh, in industrial uh, furnace applications and combustion furnaces uh, to significantly reduce the amount of CO2 that's produced, as well as NOx and, and other harmful emittents, has, has really been a, a mainstay for us as we move forward in this space. We're working with steel companies to go ahead and, and displace uh, some of the carbon that they use in their feedstock with hydrogen uh, to go ahead and reduce their CO2 footprint. Um, we continue to develop new ideas and new applications. As you can imagine, our customers are always searching for a better way to do what they do. Uh, sometimes they have very exacting technical needs that can only be met uh, with, with new capabilities. And we bring those capabilities to bear. And as we do that, with the mindset we have on innovation and sustainability, those new ideas we bring to bear that likely could not allow them to do what they needed to do in the past with the previous generations, of, of capabilities that maybe the industries could provide, allow them to have those capabilities, but to do it in, in a much more sustainable way. Sometimes cutting the carbon footprint uh, by, by as much as tenfold as you look at some of the impact. And then, and then finally, we bring applications to bear uh, to actually capture and help sequester CO2. Uh, we have capabilities in, in cryocap technology and cold membrane technology that utilize cryogenics uh, paired with our membrane systems that would allow you to capture 90 to 98 percent of the of the process CO2, uh, which may be in a lot of streams in industry uh, or even in the combustion streams uh, from many industrial systems. So, so that again is another way that we see ourselves contributing to our stakeholders need to go ahead and help them manage their carbon emissions. And, and then finally, and, and the real driver here for us in the, the future is about ecosystems, and that is how do we contribute to a low carbon society? And, and we look to bring new technologies, new ideas to bear, and, and help drive some of the uh, some of the needs of the future, the, the evolving needs that we see in the world around us. And, and there are some things that we've already put in place. Uh, for example, the ability to generate biogas. Uh, from landfills, uh, from biodigesters, with our membrane systems. So we can recover uh, and, and separate the various streams that are off gases. You can recover that uh, almost synthetic natural gas and from a circularity, circularity standpoint, reuse that in other systems or, or even make uh, renewable products using it. Um, another key thing that we've done is we've looked at cold chain logistics on a worldwide basis. Uh, cold chain logistics recognize that many things today, if you think about foods, if you think about pharmaceuticals, if you think about some of the new vaccines that will help treat what we're dealing with with the pandemic, uh, require either frozen states or significantly refrigerated states to operate. And you can imagine the mechanical systems engaged to go ahead and do all those things. And, and we've developed eco-friendly systems to go ahead and do that with our cryogenic liquids and, and to go ahead and demonstrate the ability in a, in a very low carbon way uh, to meet those cold logistic needs around the world. And then finally, the key point of all this is also to think about that energy transition and where does that energy transi transition take us? And we really see hydrogen as, as one of the core components that will help uh, bring, I would say, a more sustainable source of energy for the future. Um, we, we see it that it's a source of energy that can be produced in a low carbon way, uh, certainly through electrolysis, through biomethane, or, or even with carbon capture as need be. Uh, it's readily transportable. 
you can transport it by truck, by pipeline, by long distance if you want to do that on a ship. We've also got the capabilities, obviously, to think about storage and storage long term. We've already begun to demonstrate those things right here in the state of Texas. And, and clearly, you can produce clean power or heat for transportation, for stationary applications. And it's really evolved to be a, a direct requirement in many industries as a clean feedstock uh, for, for those industries to grow and to evolve. About three years ago, McKinsey actually took a look at hydrogen. Uh, they tried to understand what this energy vector could bring to the world around us and how that might grow and how that might evolve over time. And, and as you can see in their study, if we begin to look at just where we were in, in the normal uses of hydrogen, primarily for industrial demand in 2015, you can see an over tenfold potential increase between now and, and 2050 to go ahead and utilize uh, hydrogen uh, from an energy perspective to serve many markets. Clearly in, in power generation and, and buffering and storage, uh, a very big element in transportation, uh, clearly to provide energy and feedstocks for industry, and, and also as you begin to look at building heating and power in the future and how things can be co-produced and, and leveraged. So we see this as a, as a critical driver of the future, and, if in fact we are gonna see this enabled, if in fact we are gonna see this grow the way we think it can, the way we think it can provide some of the real benefits in the world around us, it, it takes a lot of different elements to come to bear. I think the first thing we saw was the need to bring global pioneering leaders on board to help develop the concepts, to help develop the ideas. And, and we were founders of a group called the Hydrogen Council. It started with six like-minded companies uh, we co-founded it with Toyota. And, and today that has already grown to 92 uh, companies on a global basis that are contributing and thinking and actually beginning to drive the implementation of hydrogen in the world around us. The second piece is developing a vision, I would say from a, a major and a regional ecosystem basis. So you may have a concept globally, but how do you make that work regionally? How do you build the ecosystems? Uh, to allow this to flourish? How do you have the tech, develop the technologies, the production capabilities, the storage capabilities, uh, the transport capabilities to go ahead and, and meet the world's needs from a hydrogen standpoint? And of course, to do some of those things as you start uh, from scratch in some areas, you've really got to think about what are the support programs? What are the objectives we set? We've talked about some of those today uh, already with others' presentations. And, and I think working with policymakers around the world to help enable this will be critical. And, and then finally, I think scale up is with anything. And, and, and I think that uh, Stan talked about that as well. You know, I think scale up is gonna be critical here. It's not only scale up to demonstrate at scale the capabilities, the technologies, the things we, we've not only developed and we know how to do, but kind of that next generation. But as you get the economies of scale, uh, you will begin to drive the costs and the economics in the right direction, as, as you will with availability. Today, if you just look at where the developments are, this is happening around the world. And, and today, there are over 50 major projects uh, that have been announced and are underway, uh, resulting in an investment of over $100 billion as we look at what's going on. Many of these have been announced uh, during the height of the pandemic as we've seen some of these some of these drivers in the world generate, I would say, a, a new way of thinking, a new way of approaching the world and, and how we think about energy and how we think about climate. And, and I won't go through all these, but you can see the size and the impact we're talking about. Um, clearly, it, a lot of this began in Europe. A lot of this began with a, a drive in Europe on climate. And, and not a surprise, you have France and Germany that are really leading the way, but the small Nordic countries throughout all of Europe, uh, you see a real drive uh, to convert to a, a basic hydrogen infrastructure uh, to meet society's needs. Similarly, in, in uh, Asia, obviously Japan uh, was at the forefront uh, along with us as we began to look at this with Toyota some years back. But here recently, we've seen South Korea and we've also seen China. Uh, really get significantly engaged. They see, they see hydrogen as a true energy vector, and, and especially for those countries that do not have enough indigenous supply to meet their own energy needs. They see this as a real opportunity for them uh, to go ahead and meet their energy needs of the future and do it in a more sustainable way. 
And, and if we then move and, and we think about what does this mean in the U.S.? And this study was just released by McKinsey this week. Yesterday was Hydrogen Day in, in the world around us. And, and you can see in terms of the potential benefits that hydrogen can bring and the growth that goes along with it, uh, you can see that, that hydrogen uh, potentially could almost double in, in the course of the next 10 years and, and certainly grow fivefold. Uh, sixfold by the time we get to 2050. And, and again, the, the main focus in the McKinsey study looked at power distribution, uh, it looked at forklifts and material handling, uh, it looked at all size of trucks, especially commercial vehicles and heavy duty, um, the evolution in light duty uh, and passenger vehicles, and, and then with feedstock. And, and I mentioned some of the other areas as well that I won't go into. Uh, that are more nascent in their development today that we're trying to go ahead and help with new technologies and applications. But I think the important thing to understand, there is already a very significant use of hydrogen in forklifts and material handling. Uh, the Amazons, the, the uh, Walmarts, uh, the Coca-Colas of the world are already utilizing hydrogen powered forklifts. We're already seeing the introduction of vehicles as, as we look at what's happening in California and the potential in the Northeast. And so these things are already here. We already know they're going to grow. And, and so we're in a place as, as a company where we've, we've been in the hydrogen business for many years. Um, the slide says over 40 years. The reality is it's more like 50 in terms of industrial needs. And, and our, our Lurgy engineering arm uh, has been involved in, in hydrogen almost for 100 years when you begin to look at everything that we're involved in. And we have a very strong infrastructure in the world around us uh, to produce vast quantities of hydrogen, uh, transport that hydrogen, meet our customers' needs. And we already have uh, a lot of experience with electrolyzers. And, and as we sit today right here in the U.S., we are already making very significant investments uh, that will begin to start up later this year to produce truly clean hydrogen. I know everybody wants to talk colors and, and that sort of thing. I get worried that we get mixed up in some of the colors, but this is truly clean hydrogen. And, and, and this is hydrogen at a source in a totally renewable way. Uh, we, are, we are investing in the facilities in Nevada uh, that will be utilized both to produce hydrogen uh, using some of that bio off gas that I spoke of and renewable power uh, to produce that hydrogen and liquefy it to serve the nascent market in California that is about to grow. And there's already a, a, a number of stations uh, in the state of California for refueling stations. Uh, we are part of those, uh, not only in terms of our own stations that we own and operate, but we are now part of a, of a consortium group uh, with First Element. And, and you see this growth in that infrastructure. You see that evolution. And there will be a significant introduction of, of new vehicles uh, into the state uh, beginning about a year from now. In addition, we have made significant investments up in Beckencore. So Beckencore is the Canadian side of Niagara Falls. And, and this is an investment in the world's largest scale PEM electrolyzer. Uh, PEM is, is the next generation of electrolyzer technology. And, and we see this as a, a critical component of the future. Uh, not only do we see it as a critical component of the future, but we decided as well to invest in the company joint with Cummins to go ahead and further develop those fuel cell technologies. And, and in addition, working with uh, Toyota, we are building out the infrastructure in the Northeast, uh, building 12 hydrogen refueling stations uh, that will be served out of Beckencore. Uh, to go ahead and, and meet the needs in the Northeast as new vehicles are introduced as well. And in addition, we can utilize this hydrogen in a number of other industrial ways, both in the U.S. and in Canada. So I'll stop there, Ken. I, I know we're a bit short on time. I want to make sure we can get to a good Q&A, uh, but I, I appreciate the opportunity to share some of that, and I look forward to the, the questions and, and some of the commentary. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you, Mike. And um, there have been a lot of questions come through, and I kind of knew when we were building this uh, this entire discussion that a lot of the things that the questions that would be raised by our viewers uh, in, in, in response to Stan's presentation um, would be addressed actually by you and uh, Steve and Greg. So uh, it works out very well. Um, I have one question I want to throw to the floor, and maybe I'll, I'll Stan, I'll ask you to kind of address this first, and then we can kind of go through the line. Um, you know, Mike sort of laid out an issue that I know you're keenly aware of. When we talk about 
um, deep decarbonization, it really becomes an ultimate coordination problem because you've got to talk about investing in multiple positions along a value chain that is maybe not that well developed in some cases. Um, uh, and so it requires investment by multiple different companies in concert with one another effectively. Now policy can play a clearly defining role in that, but it gets even more complicated when you think about the global nature of, uh, of decarbonization. Um, just to throw a data point out for our listeners, um, even if all of the developed countries of the world, so the countries in the OECD, were to cut emissions to zero today, global emissions would still be at 1995 levels. And that's because of the massive growth we've seen in non-OECD countries, so in the developing world. And so what that really highlights is in thinking about decarbonization in a deep and meaningful, long-lasting way, um, how do we think about building resilience in a supply chain that needs to be developed here in the U.S. and then hopefully set an example how that can be exported globally? Um, but at the same time, doing so in a world where you have more electrification. Uh, because we all know that we grapple now with grid resilience and, and thinking about scaling that up by a factor of two and, and dealing with the same problem. It's a challenge, to say the least. So, uh, Stan, if I can start with you to kind of address that and then we'll kind of move down the line. Yeah, Ken, th thank you. Um, uh, I'm listening to these these uh, colleagues on the panel and a, a couple of examples, I think, that kind of get to your point of collaboration, coordination. This is bigger than just one sector kind of conversations. You know, even, but, but even on a micro scale, uh, spent a great deal of time talking within our own industry with OEMs about this. I'm going to pick up on the hydrogen uh, example as one, making sure that they're thinking about enabling the utilization of hydrogen in assets that we currently own today or we could be buying in the future or we could be retrofitting in the future. You know, the, the resilience of the system that carries this fuel around is important. The pipeline system, the gas distribution system, us working together with uh, the manufacturers of those materials to be sure we're planning for safety, reliability, and resiliency going forward. I do think it is one of, you know, one of the benefits we get out of the LCRI initiative I mentioned earlier of, of having many players at the table to think about this because it is bigger than just the electric sector. But, you know, I also see opportunities. Um, as uh, as as we heard around hydrogen, you know, I'll, I'll tell you in Alabama we have a number of steel manufacturers. Um, they too are going to have challenges uh, to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, maybe there's solutions where the power company, uh, not only for their own needs, uh, could work with the air liquids and and the. Uh, in the steel industry and come up with some sort of centralized production of an alternative energy carrier like hydrogen to serve multiple sectors. So I, I think your point's well made. This is bigger than one sector. It's bigger than one industry. Um, and we'll be making some mistakes, I think, for the efficiency of the solutions if we don't think bigger than, than just our little, our little knot hole. Right. Uh, Greg, building building on that, I think that's that's a well posed, actually. Um, a carbon fee. Um, you mentioned the role of research and development. You mentioned competitive advantage. Um, you know, you, you even raised what which I said before is an interesting concept of, of carbon efficiency being priced in. But, you know, all of this stuff really goes to um, uh, the development long term of lower carbon solutions. Uh, and thinking about how a carbon fee is implemented. And I know you guys have done a lot of modeling of this work, um, you know, looking at the economy-wide impacts. And that's really where I'm going with this is um, the implementation of the program, you, you, you kind of highlighted the differences in carbon efficiency, but in terms of implementing the program, what kind of impacts have you actually seen in the work that you've done looking forward um, with regard to a carbon fee in terms of R&D, in terms of the evolution of different industries domestically, um, and then maybe, uh, uh, you know, what that means for uh, delivered energy, quite frankly, because at the end of the day, affordability matters. Everybody sort of made that point, right? And um, there's different ways to get at that. It's just by lower cost sources of energy and or uh, compensating mechanisms, which is one of the things that you referenced. So uh, with that, I'll pass it over to you, Greg. 
Yeah, thanks, Ken. I, I, mean, I think the thing we have to remember is there's not going to be one silver bullet from a technology standpoint, and there's not going to be one silver bullet from a policy standpoint to, to solve this issue. But there are some really high value things we can do right now from a policy perspective. And what I think is most important first is we need to get the incentives right in the marketplace. And this is why we're so supportive of the price on carbon, because we believe in the power of the market economy to drive big change, drive big investment. Um, and so that's what the price gets you. But the other thing it gets you and gets my, uh, my, my fellow panel members and many of, and you know, most other businesses or all other businesses in all industries is some level of certainty. I think we all operate under the assumption that the future will include some form of climate policies, but none of us know what they are going to be with any degree of certainty. And if we in the U.S. were able to get that part figured out, the main policy behind our carbon reduction strategy, which, you know, you know, you know what we think is the right approach. But if that were in place, you know, our utilities who are making decades long investments would be able to do so with the knowledge or with greater confidence of what the future was going to hold from a policy standpoint. Same, same with our other energy companies and all of the industries that support those industries. Um, and we need that to make these, and these are massive investments that have to be made. And it's only gonna to be to our benefit economically. It's only gonna be our, to our benefit from an emission standpoint. If we can get the incentives right, and if we can give greater certainty to the marketplace so that we can start unleashing these innovations and unleashing these investments throughout the economy. Hey, Ken, Stan, Stan Conley here. Could I make a quick right, comment? Man. Look, Absolutely. I, I think Greg has hit a really important point there. And, and the way we talk about it is harmonizing all of the policies that come together that over the course of history, quite frankly, have created the uncertainty that was referenced there. Couldn't agree more that we need to be sure we get some clarity going forward. And at the same time, allow some for some flexibility and some differences of the sectors. Um, you know, for the benefit of those regions they serve in, those markets they're in. Uh, you said it earlier, the devil's in the details, but I, look, I just wanted to foot stomp what, what he was saying there. Getting clarity for the long term, he's right. We make investments for 40, 60 years, and we need to know for on behalf of our customers, frankly, that they'll be able to count on those for the long term. Great. So Steve, um, uh, I said I was gonna come back to you about scaling nature-based solutions. Um, it, it really does fit into the broad portfolio of these discussions. And there've been a couple of questions that come across asking about scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. And, um, you know, to what extent uh, are, 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 are y'all looking at scope one, two, and three emissions in your, in your offset programs? Um, uh, and uh, so just pro provide some clarity on that, but then also just thinking forward um, in terms of scaling uh, uh, some of these programs so that you can continue to provide the type of service that you, you that you laid out, right, um, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a reliable way, in an affordable way. Um, what sort of programs do you all have envisioned for doing that? Yeah, thanks, Ken. Um, well, first of all, to, to answer the initial question, um, our um, net carbon-free solutions are scope one, scope two, and scope three across Shell, regardless of what we're doing. For an LNG cargo, about 25% of the offsets are to cover scope one and scope two to produce and deliver the cargo, and about 75% relate to the scope three, the emissions actually burning the LNG. Um, I think this is linked back to the previous discussion on carbon pricing and the importance of it. You know, We can't just rely on offsetting. We have to actually do things. Offsetting is the last solution in a whole sequence, a whole chain of solutions. And it's really important that you have carbon pricing to get to the optimal net zero solution, not just any net zero solution. Um, but in terms of carbon pricing, sorry, in terms of nature-based solutions, this is quite, we're quite early in the evolution of this business, but customers are very, very 
sophisticated. They're not just interested in, you know, how many trees is it? it? Is it the right type of trees, the right density of trees? Are we getting the right biodiversity? You know, are we thinking about all the associated issues regarding soil, regarding water, regarding uh, employment or wildlife? So while standard, standardization and verification will be becoming more and more important, the actual quality of the offsets is probably the, the biggest issue. And for us, it's making sure that we create a product that meets a uniform quality that we are you know happy to stand behind and we think it actually gives the customers what what they think they are getting and clearly that you know requires developing more projects in more places to a to a high standard and and that's what we're doing great thanks um so unfortunately we're getting close to time so mike i'm going to turn to you for the last uh last question and by all means if anybody has anything they want to throw in uh, in response to this question, after Mike uh, responds, please do so. Um, uh, hydrogen is, as I said at the outset, it's sort of like the, the fuel of 2020. It's gotten a lot of attention. You outlined some things that are happening around the world uh, uh, in real time. Uh, you're actually seeing that space evolve very quickly. One of the things that's always struck me about hydrogen is uh, oftentimes people who aren't really aware of it uh, don't understand that there's an existing market. Um, and that existing market can be scaled, uh, and it relies uh, largely on feedstocks from traditional fuels to operate. So natural gas, for example, and sort of connecting back to what Stan mentioned, what Greg mentioned, what Steve mentioned, um, you know, one of the interesting things to me about providing low cost solutions is imagine a world where you can deliver natural gas long distances LNG, you actually have some offset protocols and whatnot where you're you're using to deliver on a scope one and scope two basis. But then the scope three emissions are effectively addressed through uh, the generation of hydrogen with carbon capture or some other sort of technology to reduce that carbon footprint. Um, uh, Mike, I mean, you're you're right in the middle of all this. Are you seeing interest in that space? Is is that something that you see evolving going forward? Because you know, a lot of times, and you mentioned electrolyzers, that, that will, you know, in certain places could create some stress on water resource availability. Um, uh, so there are other issues that, that sort of are out there. And ultimately, thinking about the portfolio approach, uh, this is definitely going to work in some places, maybe not in others. But um, in terms of scaling the market, what do you think the potential is beyond what you saw, saw in the McKinsey study and what you're seeing on the ground? So, Ken, I, I think there's a number of aspects to this. Um, certainly, there are the traditional sources of hydrogen today, and we operate those around the world. Uh, as you pointed out, you know, we're very engaged in that. And we have developed technologies uh, to fully utilize natural gas and, and capture uh, the carbon emissions. Um, I had mentioned some technologies that we have. We've got the cryocap technology, which is a combination cryogenic coal box in a, a membrane system uh, that allows you to take the process off gas and capture 98% of, of all the carbon dioxide and at the same time cool it to a super critical uh, temperature and it's liquefied and now you can ship it and do what you need to do with it and sequester it. So you've, you've got that piece. We've got the cold membrane technology as well uh, that we can utilize on the combustion gases, whether that's for a steam methane reformer or it's for any other industrial process. We can also use cryocap for some of those as well. And there you're gonna get probably a 90% capture rate when you, when you look at that. So you can get to a very low carbon source of hydrogen and you can also for other industrial processes significantly reduce the carbon footprint. And then obviously you've got to have the ecosystem to go ahead and sequester uh, that carbon. Uh, you know, traditionally on the Gulf Coast, we always think about tertiary oil recovery. Uh, in the Midwest, they're obviously looking at saline aquifers and, and somehow all this has to come together in, in the right way. And, and I think that this is where working across the various ecosystems and beginning to think of how things can work together uh, will actually will bring us closer to a solution. Uh, I think Stan had talked about the grid and the resilience of, of the grid and, and how you manage that. So we, we want to go ahead and utilize renewable power. We want to go ahead and utilize solar and we want to use wind. And obviously the sun goes down at night. Wind is only there 40 percent of the time. So what do you do when it's not there? So obviously we're fortunate that we have 
the kind of infrastructure that Stan has that's multifaceted and, and can meet uh, his customers' needs day in and day out, irregardless. But in the future, if you're really going to grow that dependency, you need to be able to store that hydrogen. And, and I think that that's where you're going to get the resilience for grid backup. And, and also then you start to link other industry uh, into that as well when you start to think about the use of hydrogen, how that can play out. And, and it creates a different mindset growing from what we've got on the Gulf Coast to a more regional infrastructure for what can be done. And, and I understand that, that clearly on, on the, the issues for um, electrolysis, that it uses large quantities of water. But as you know, steam methane reformer also uses a lot of water. As a matter of fact, half the hydrogen produced comes from water. So, so you, you, you're always going to have that balance, and we've got to make sure we manage that in the right way, and, and we drive that in the right way. And I don't belittle that whatsoever. That is a critically important aspect, what we have to do. But in the end, some of this as well comes back to the point that both uh, Greg and then Stan talked about as well. Obviously, you need certainty and regulation and legislation uh, for any long-term investment. And we see that in, in every industry that, that everyone is in. And, and I think that you've got to have the mindset uh, to advance smart climate solutions as part of those regulations, as part of that legislation. We've got to continue the R&D efforts, more importantly, the scale-up efforts uh, in public-private partnerships that can be driven with DOE and like-minded companies that uh, Stan went ahead and talked about. And, and in addition to all that, uh, we haven't talked about infrastructure. And, and for everything we're talking about, the right infrastructure has got to be in place. And we've got to rethink the grid. We've got to rethink infrastructure for hydrogen. We've got to rethink a lot of different things to make this work. And, and if we're going to do that, we've got to build the infrastructure for the 21st century, not just rebuild the old infrastructure that we put in place in the 20th century. And, and whether that's for energy, whether that's for digital and 5G, whatever the case may be, I think all these things come crashing together. Can I just build on that, Ken, just for a second? Please, go ahead, Steve, yeah. Yeah, you asked a question before about the benefits of portfolio businesses, and I think a great example for this is our Nort H2 project in the Netherlands. We're developing 10 gigawatts of offshore wind generation. Some of it will go to other power demand, but some of it will go to supply a large hydroelectrolyzer we're going to build in the Netherlands with a 800,000 ton a year capacity. We have our own retail network in Europe, so we can use that to supply hydrogen to trucks. It's, it's by Rotterdam, so we can supply to trucks. And we have our own refinery, so we can use that to balance the supply and demand as the supply steps up in um, steps and the demand kind of grows over time. So, you know, obviously we'll need to work with industry and other players, but, you know, companies like ourselves with the big portfolio benefits have, you know, the ability to put a lot of this together. Excellent. That's a, that's actually a great point. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier the, uh, the, this being the ultimate coordination problem and the portfolio approach actually allows you to flex where you can and, and leverage certain competitive advantages that Greg mentioned earlier uh, in different ways in different places around the world. And um, I want to thank all of you for participating today because it, I think you did a really good job collectively of highlighting that point. Um, uh, not only uh, in, in the electric power space, but Stan, you did a good job of talking about this as an energy issue, because it certainly is. Um, uh, and we got to hear from uh, uh, Greg about some potential policy levers that could be pulled uh, to really unlock market forces uh, to drive uh, a new outcome. And then Steve and Mike, uh, again, thanks to both of you for highlighting uh, different aspects of your businesses and, and where they stand to grow and actually serve as a solution. So um, with that, we're going to go ahead and close the panel. Uh, we're a little bit over. I wish we could have another 30 minutes because I'm sure there's lots of stuff we could still talk about. But again, I appreciate everybody for joining us and uh, stay safe and stay healthy.